The following interview was broadcast live on IsraelNationalRadio.com. Today's Eidelberg Report is on to hell with the United Nations. Welcome to the show, Professor Paul Eidelberg. Good morning, and hello, everybody. It's time for Israel to quit the United Nations. Indeed, it is, it is demeaning for the Jewish Commonwealth to remain in, in that international cesspool. For decades, the United Nations has passed countless resolutions condemning Israel for its actions against the Palestinians, while almost never formally addressing Israel's security concerns and the ongoing campaign of Palestinian terrorism against Israelis. The UN General Assembly has become an international forum for promoting Palestinian statehood and delegitimizing Israel. Before Oslo, the General Assembly condemned, vigorously condemned, strongly condemned, deplored, strongly deplored, censured, denounced Israel 321 times. The Arabs, zero condemnations. Meanwhile, the Security Council condemned, censured, deplored, strongly deplored, etc., Israel 49 times. Arab states, zero. Yes, it is time for Israel to quit this den of iniquity. Having a forum at the UN is of dubious value, as is the UN itself. John Bolton, former acting U.S. ambassador to the UN, has said, there is no such thing as the United Nations. There is only the international community, which can only be led by the only remaining superpower, which is the United States. He also said that the the Secretariat building in New York has 38 stories, and if you lost 10 stories today, it wouldn't make a bit of a difference. Fred Flights, a former senior advisor to Bolton, exposes UN waste and corruption and the resulting human costs. His book, Peacekeeping Fiascos of the 1990s, interviews, or rather provides, a comprehensive critical assessment of the UN. Among other debacles, he shows how the failed UN mission in Bosnia led to unmitigated atrocities, how the UN debacle in Somalia emboldened terrorists the world over, how the UN peacekeeping operations in Haiti collapsed with the billions of dollars squandered on it, primarily benefiting Haitian President Jean-Bertrand Aristide. And then there was the oil for food scam between the UN and Saddam Hussein. Now let us focus on Iran. It's obvious the UN will do nothing and can do nothing to stop Iran's nuclear weapons program. And judging from uh, the Obama's uh, policy of appeasing Islam, the U.S. will do nothing to stop Tehran's nuclear weapons program, which may be only months away from producing its first bomb. For Israel, a nuclear-armed Iran is an existential issue that raises the specter of another holocaust. Israel must therefore take its future into its own hands. It must act unilaterally and choose the moment to attack Iran, as former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Mr. Bolton urged in the Wall Street Journal on December 7, 2007. Bolton wrote that if Israel attacks uh, Iran's nuclear facilities, the U.S. should aid Israel before, during, and after such an attack, but this was before Obama's election. Dare Israel pull a fait accompli as it did with the Osiric reactor in 1981? Dare it wait until Iran deploys the bomb? Bolton would surely say no. It's time to take a closer look at what a nuclear-armed Iran portends, not only for Israel, but for Europe 
and the United States, indeed for Western civilization. Here, let us consult Robert Bayer, the most far-seeing, experienced former CIA operative in the Middle East. Last year, in his book, The Devil We Know, Bear convincingly argues that Iran, contrary to what most people believe, Iran is a, is a regime not of crazies. Its supreme leader, Ayatollah al Ali Khamenei, head of the Revolutionary Guard, is pursuing a political strategy whose goal is to restore the Persian Empire. Iran's nuclear weapons development program must be viewed in these grandiose terms. As for President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, he is Khomeini's subordinate. Ahmadinejad's imprecations death to America and death to Israel should not be dismissed as the ranting of a maniac. It is a double entendre. For the naive, it obscures Iran's Machiavellian modus operandi. For the cognoscenti, death to America and death to Israel signify the demise of Christianity and Judaism and the global ascendancy of Islam. Let us take a closer look at the location of Iran, a nation of 70 million people. Iran's strategic location on the Persian Gulf will enable the Revolutionary Guard to turn off the flow of oil on which the West's survival now depends. Moreover, Iran is rapidly developing a worldwide network of power. Iraq, which is after all 60% Shiite, will succumb to Iran when the Americans leave. Iran is luring Turkey into its orbit as it did Syria. Iran's proxy as is positioned to control Lebanon. Iran is the main supplier of Hamas, and Iran has eyes on Fatah. Iran has already penetrated the Suez Canal. Iran has sleeper cells throughout Europe and even in America. Iran is collaborating with anti-American forces in South America. And, of course, Iran supports countless mosques in the United States that preach jihad against America and the West. If this were not enough, hundreds of millions of Muslims throughout the world support jihad. If Iran's long-range ballistic missiles are tipped with nuclear warheads, Europe, already inundated with more than 50 million Muslims, will be blackmailed into submission. Without Europe and its economy, the American economy will collapse beyond repair. Iran knows this. The U.S. is necessarily Iran's primary target, but Israel, the small Satan, comes first. Perhaps Iran will not need to devastate America by exploding an electromagnetic pulse over Washington to terminate the great Satan. Viewed in this light, the United Nations is passé and good riddance. If a new UN is desirable, it should consist solely of the 90 or so states classified as democracies by Freedom House, in which the state itself is the custodian of man's God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In any, if any country from both a historical and theological perspective, is qualified to promote the formation of such United Nations. It is Israel. Of course, not the Israel that kowtows to terrorist thugs. I mean an Israel on the way to constructing the Third Temple, when once Jerusalem stood majestically, as in the days of King Solomon, attracting nations near and far. My heart and soul is recalling the prophecy of Zechariah when ten men of every nationality speaking different languages shall take hold of every Jew by the corner of his garment and say, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Yes, ten men of every nation. Surely they will be nations that abide by the seven Noahide laws of universal morality, the true Catholicism included in the Torah for all humanity. Ten men of every nationality journeying to Jerusalem, the city of peace as well as the city of truth. <laughs> 